welcome and good morning everyone to a very exclusive conversation with the leader of the Victorian Liberal Party, the Honourable Michael O'Brien. I'm Paul Guerra and together with Diane Smith, our Melbourne Chamber of Commerce CEO, we'll spend the next 30 minutes or so expanding further from the earlier session with Michael. Michael O'Brien has been the leader of the Victorian Liberal Party since 2018 and as you will have seen from the previous conversation, he's not only a very decent person, he has a very big vision for Victoria. Welcome back, Michael. Great to be here, Paul. Great to be with Melbourne Chamber of Commerce. I think uh, last time I, I did a function, it was a, it was a sit down lunch. This is a little bit different. Yeah, Time to change. <laughs> and we're hoping to get to you to a lunch as well before uh, this crazy world of COVID um, took off. Michael, we, we want to get into details down here. So it'll be a, it's an exclusive group. It's a different group. These represent you know, the larger organisations within the, the chamber and, and are with us to help make a difference to Victoria. So I thought what we might do is just a quick wrap, uh, a quick rewrap of the plan that you outlaid, and then I'll hand it over to Diane to you know, pick up some of the questions that the members have sent in. Sure. Yeah, look, thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, the purpose behind our plan is that we just see that Victoria is facing a massive economic challenge at the moment. So we've, we've flattened the curve, but we've flattened the economy. Um, and because of the structure of Victoria's economy, where we've um, you know, quite uh, uh, reliant on uh, tourism, international students, these are all areas which have been particularly hard hit by the coronavirus and may not be coming back uh, for a while. Uh, we just, there's so much uncertainty. So our view is what can we do to get Victoria back to work and back in business now? Um, so we've come up with a plan, uh, which you know, this is sort of, this is not our saying what, what we'll do at the next election, because frankly, we can't afford to wait two years. We want, we want Daniel Andrews to take up these ideas and run with them now. Um, we're, so our plan is basically four different pillars. One is securing personal finances. There are things the state government can do to try and make life easier for families, have more money in their pockets. So it's freezes on taxes, charges, uh, freezes on public transport fares, uh, reducing energy bills, which we think they can do directly through uh, a one-off increase to the concession for uh, energy users, but also through policies such as uh, promoting energy from waste generation and removing the ridiculous ban on onshore conventional natural gas. Uh, so that's pillar one, securing personal finances because confident families, confident people will spend more and that keeps the money flowing throughout the economy. Second part is uh, rebuilding local economies. We need to focus on projects that are ready to go now. Don't worry about your pie in the sky, suburban rail loops, forget that, or at least put that on the back burner. What we need is things that we can do today to get people back into work. Uh, tangible projects, so whether it's uh, fixing up local uh, sporting venues, whether it's about fixing up local schools, uh, repairing roads, goodness knows, there's plenty of things that you can look around your community and say, hey, that could be done, that could be improved. Let's try and get those, those tangible, shovel-ready projects going so that we can actually get things back to work. Um, let's also cut some of the red tape around planning, around development. Uh, in fact, let's cut, this is a great excuse, an opportunity to cut red tape right across the state government. Um, you know, we, are, we are one of the most, we're the, high, we're the highest tax state in the country, in Victoria. Part of the reason is we've got a whole lot of red tape and bureaucracy that we're paying for. Uh, this is a great opportunity to do, hit the reset button and try and streamline things and make uh, a regulatory system that works for business and works for Victoria rather than holding things back. Uh, we're particularly keen on uh, payroll tax reductions, uh, particularly because a lot of businesses are nervous about bringing staff back on. Uh, we're saying, for, at least for the next financial year, increase the payroll tax threshold to $10 million. We also want to see re uh, manufacturing brought back, revitalisation of it. Uh, the paucity, the, the um, fragility of our supply chains was really exposed during this pandemic. Yeah. Couldn't even produce test kits for ourselves. Couldn't even produce enough personal protective equipment for ourselves. Uh, let's invest seriously in securing local supply chains. Uh, and I'm, we're proposing a, a billion dollar fund to help uh, to relocate overseas manufacturing back to Victoria, to expand local manufacturing here. Uh, R&D, commercialisation, value adding. Let's take Victoria's innovations, our ideas, uh, and let's actually do the value adding here rather than sending them offshore. 
And, and let's get to the last two pillars so that we can get rolling with some of the oh, questions. Yep, that, absolutely. Uh, number three, building better communities. Essentially, uh, on education, we need to make sure that uh, kids who have fallen behind through this whole period of remote learning are brought back up to speed. Uh, let's support schools to run additional classes to get those kids back where they need to be. Let's also tackle the elective surgery waiting list, which has blown out massively. Uh, and the fourth pillar is keeping your family safe. Basically, we know there's going to be a lot of social dislocation caused by the lockdown, by the pandemic, and by the economic consequences of that. It's really important uh, for community safety that the government deals with those issues, whether it's around mental health, whether it's around public housing, whether it's around family violence. So we've put forward a positive agenda that we want the government to take up to help get Victoria back to work, back in business. Yeah, it's just great. And it's resonating really well through the questions we've had. I'm going to hand over to Diane Smith now. She's got some questions from our members. Diane. Thanks very much, Paul. And good morning, Michael. And thanks for this additional opportunity to um, chat with the Melbourne Chamber members. From just about all of our university members, what should Victoria do to rebuild services exports? Now, you spoke a lot about um, international tourism, but in particular, international students. Yep. Um, Diane, that's, that is one of the things we, we specify in the plan. We think that the state government needs to work very closely with the federal government to get those international students back. Now, I personally, I think there's an opportunity uh, where you could get international students back. Yes, we, we need to observe the quarantine, but I would have thought that this is, given what international students mean to our economy, I would have thought there's a role for state and federal government to maybe even look at covering the cost of 14 day quarantine uh, because you know, we need to get those students back. Uh, it is essential, not just for universities, but for um, every, every other part of the Victorian economy. Um, now we think that uh, that's something that should be an absolute priority. Uh, state and federal governments working together to be able to redevelop that, that pipeline of international students back here. Um, so I think there are practical measures in terms of covering the costs of uh, of uh, quarantine. Uh, beyond that, we, we welcomed the fact the state government made some announcements about payroll tax uh, exemptions and deferrals for universities, uh, I think it was earlier this week. Yep. Thank, thanks, Michael. Um, and from, I think it is silver from Oricon, so in terms of construction, uh, given the COVID crisis, uh, what are your views on Victoria's future population growth and should the current infrastructure project pipeline, so some of the larger shovel-ready projects, be adjusted to reflect the impacts of the population change? Yeah. Uh, look, Diane, I think that's it's a really interesting question. Um, I think we will see, certainly we're not going to see the movement in terms of numbers that we've seen in the past. Uh, I think history tells us that when there's a big economic shock, uh, families tend to hold off on having more kids. They're actually, you can plot sort of changes in birth rates uh, to economic consequences, because basically families uh, choose not to um, take on additional financial expenses, which as a father, I can tell you kids are, um, when they're not feeling confident in themselves. So I suspect that we'll see a reduction in natural birth rates coming out of this. Uh, I think we'll certainly see a reduction in international tourism for goodness knows how long. Um, and you know, whether we'll see a reduction in migration is obviously in the hands of the federal government because they set, they set immigration numbers. Um, but I think that uh, we should expect to see a lower rate of population growth. Certainly, I mean, Victoria's been growing at over 2% a year for the last few years, population growth. The bulk of that has been overseas migration. Uh, I think that will fall off for, for some time to come. What does that mean for construction? Well, look, um, Melbourne is a big enough city that projects that are underway need to continue. Yes, of course, we need to keep, let's do the level crossings. Of course, Mel, uh, Metro Tunnel still needs to keep going. Uh, Westgate Tunnel has been a mess, but you know, you're not going to half do these things. Um, what, what I'd say, though, to the Premier is that you know, your, your suburban rail loop, because you know, everyone wants to go from Sandringham to Broadmeadows and vice versa. Um, that's, put that on the back burner, Premier. Um, it's pie in the sky stuff. We need tangible, practical projects now. And I think there's a lot more that can be done in regional Victoria. The government has been quite Melbourne focused. I think we need to decentralise population growth. Uh, that is good socially, it's good economically. It takes some of the development pressure off Melbourne, 
and it also means we get greater economic <coughs> opportunity spread right throughout the state. So we're very big on decentralisation and we think that the pandemic actually provides an opportunity for the government to refocus, give a little bit more love and attention to regional Victoria and perhaps put on the back burner some of the, the, the massive money pit projects that the government is currently considering that frankly don't stack up. Thank you. Thanks for your plan, in particular, the focus on manufacturing. Um, we have many global manufacturers who've made their home base in Victoria. Um, some are on the line uh, today, um, Pfizer and Griffles. Um, in particular, on behalf of the Griffles company, they've made Melbourne their Australian base. Under the O'Brien government, how will they be encouraged to tap into our excellent local talent source invest further, particularly in light of, um, you know, our, our, um, our wages being higher and living, our wages higher than other countries with whom we compete? Sure. I mean, that, that is one of the areas where we are at a competitive disadvantage compared to other, other nations is we've got very high labour costs here. Um, now, that's not something that uh, a state premier can do an enormous amount about. Uh, there can be some public sector wage restraint and, and the, the current ideas of 40% wage increases for the construction workers proposed for the North East Link is just ridiculous. I mean, for goodness sake, um, people seem to be living in a bubble if they think that 40% wage increases are, are, are something that is sustainable. Um, what state governments can do is they can support with skills training and that is a big part of our plan. We think the government needs to do a lot more in terms of uh, promoting not just skills training, but the right sort of skills training. So we're, we're for example, we're uh, putting forward the idea of expanding free TAFE to all areas of skill shortages. It needs to be very much aligned, the economic subsidies and the training to where the skill shortages are. It shouldn't be just across the board. We need to be focused. We also want to see an increase in apprenticeships and traineeships. Uh, we were at about 45,000 a year or so ago. We've dropped down to 35,000. We want to see that back up to 45,000. Let's get that back in there. Um, we also want to see that energy costs brought down. That is, it used to be one of Victoria's competitive advantages. We've given that up over the last five or six years. Um, we think we can reduce energy costs through uh, unlocking Victoria's natural gas supply, which is currently, there's a moratorium on onshore natural gas. Ridiculous. It's our resources, let's use them. We also think there's a great opportunity in new, new generation like energy from waste. It's used right across the world. Uh, the current state government, for reasons that, that I still don't get, are very lukewarm about energy from waste. We think it's a great opportunity to turn an environmental problem, which is growing landfill, into an energy solution. Uh, but our fund would be about partnering with manufacturers to whether it's about uh, providing support for infrastructure for local expansion, whether it's about providing support for R&D commercialisation value adding. That's where we see real value for Victoria. If we can do more commercialisation value adding here rather than sending it offshore, uh, that secures uh, great economic opportunities for us as a state. Mm. Just on that energy, energy to waste um, part of the plan, you know, your zero to landfill plan, um, how can Victoria incorporate better sustainable practices and circular economic practices into the overarching and broader uh, recovery measures, do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, I announced our zero to landfill policy late last year, Diane, because um, I mean, we know that as a, as a growing uh, state, uh, we have got some severe constraints when it comes to, uh, to our waste and our landfill in particular. Since the implementation of the China sword policy, which saw them not accepting effectively uh, our recycling anymore, we've got to deal with these things ourselves. One of the ways we can deal with them is using energy from waste technology, which is to say it's been used all around the world. Uh, it gives you a, an energy profile which is actually cleaner than natural gas. So it's not renewable, but it's the next best thing. And it turns, it actually, it, it reduces the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the atmosphere. I mean, if you, you take food waste, you, you put it in a landfill, it rots. Uh, any sort of product like that rots, it creates methane, bad for the environment. We can turn that into an energy source, which actually will help lower your power bills. So we're very keen to see that energy from waste technology rolled out. Uh, and and you know, energy is such a critical input into business. So we, we can't do much about 
labour costs in a state in a country like Australia or even a state like Victoria. Uh, and, and you know, we we don't want to sort of see you know wage cuts, but there are other things that governments can do to promote Victoria being an economically competitive place to establish or to expand. Having uh, lower reliable energy costs is is one of one of the things we can do. Uh, having the right skills is another thing we can do. Uh, support of government policies in relation to infrastructure uh, and planning is another thing that we can do. And these are all elements of my plan. We were really pleased to take our members up to Yarra Valley Waters Energy to Waste Facility last year. And yeah, really impressive. So to do more in that space. Um, there's another question from Jamie McLennan who heads up LifeWorks organisation. How can Victoria position itself better to attract more regional headquarters? So, you know, in terms of Asia Pacific regional headquarters. Sure, look, I think um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot for uh, that Victoria offers in terms of being uh, a gateway uh, for, for, the rest of, um, you know, for the rest of the Asia Pacific. Um, I think that you know, we, we are a safe place uh, we have a good quality of life, which would make us attractive to executives who might be posted to actually go and live here. Um, you know, we, we are uh, a place that uh, we've got uh, independent courts. Uh, you know, we are relatively safe. So there's a lot to attract us, but frankly, we're in competition. We're in competition with Sydney. We're in competition with uh, New Zealand, with, with uh, other countries in Southeast Asia. So we need to be out there talking ourselves up. Um, which is funnily enough, our Australians aren't always great at talking ourselves up. Uh, <laughs> now, we've got a global network of Victorian business offices. We'd like to see that, that do more. Uh, we think that there's great opportunities, particularly in, in Indonesia and India, uh, yeah. to do more. Um, I mentioned in the previous webinar that we'd like to see with, with Brexit, we'd like to see more of a focus on the EU, particularly with a EU-Australia free trade agreement under negotiation at the moment. Uh, so we need to sell ourselves as being the place where you want to come to. Um, now we used to be the world's most livable city. Sadly, we've we've lost that that particular title. I think we're number two now. Uh, but you know there are a lot of things that we can do to say um, we've got the uh, access to markets here. You've got a uh, sound economic base here. You've got a quality of life here. Um, all those things that companies look for in terms of regional HQs, uh, we need to make sure that they're, they're thinking Melbourne, they're thinking Victoria uh, first, ahead of Sydney, uh, ahead of Perth, and ahead of uh, our competitors in Southeast Asia. So I think we've got a great product, but we need to do better to actually sell ourselves, which is typically not something that Aussies are great at doing, but we need to just, um, just do it because uh, you know, I think we stack up really well against all our competitors. We agree with that and uh, <laughs> totally. Um, I think I have time for maybe one more question, Paul. At least, yeah, you might get oh. another two in. Oh, excellent. Okay, <laughs> Michael, um, going back to red tape, uh, what's your position regarding overhauling uh, state regulation to support business growth? And in particular, we've had several members talk about work cover issues. Well, red tape's the bane of my life. When, when, I was, when I was treasurer, Diane, I used to say, please uh, bring me examples of red tape that drives you mad because if, there's a, because if there's red tape there, there's a public servant or two or 10 who are administering them. And frankly, I'd rather put them to work doing something useful rather than just holding business back. So I do think that the pandemic actually provides an opportunity for a reset from the state government to eliminate a whole lot of red tape that is just Holding, holding us back. Um, I know the, I get a lot of uh, feedback on environmental regulations, uh, particularly uh, native vegetation crossover with federal regulation. It, it can be very, very messy. Mm -hmm. The government is, this current state government has introduced a lot of new regulation. Uh, Labor hire licensing has been a mess. Even the industrial manslaughter laws that are coming in on the 1st of July. We're very concerned about how they're going to operate uh, and particularly in a, in a COVID-19 environment. I mean, if uh, uh, you know, we, we don't, we obviously, we don't want to see anybody um, infected, let alone die. But what if somebody catches something at a workplace? Is an employer going to be held liable, criminally liable for that? Um, so we just think that the government has an opportunity to work with the business community and work out what is the red tape that is 
reducing confidence, which is holding you back, which is when you're making that marginal decision about expansion or not, about employing somebody or not. We want, we want business in this state to have the confidence to go, no, no, the government's going to make it easier for me, not make it harder for me. So um, I suppose part of my, my plea would be if there are specific examples of red tape, and you know, I, I'm hearing a lot about work cover, uh, but other, other examples, let me know because we are quite happy to be strong advocates for reducing that red tape. It makes sense economically, and frankly, it makes sense in terms of uh, getting the state back to work. Earlier, Paul referred to Andrew Liveris, who's currently uh, working with the NCCC. He also said in a, a recent webinar, Australia can invent, it can develop, and it can um, produce things at scale, um, working to our competitive advantages. So I suppose the question is about um, what can be done to unlock and maximise innovation as part of uh, an ongoing uh, industry investment program? Yeah. Well, Diane, I suppose, I mean, you, you look around, we've got um, um, in pharmaceuticals, for example, food technology, uh, you know, a lot of great companies here, great ideas here, but, but often we see the R&D, the development, uh, tends to happen elsewhere. And then the commercialization of products that are Victorian ideas, Victorian innovations, or even broaden out and say Australian ideas, Australian innovations, a lot of that commercialization tends to take place elsewhere. And then they sell, they sell it back to us. Um, why can't we do more of that here? Now, uh, global capital is one issue, but I've, I've got a view that global capital will, will that they will they will chase an idea and they will chase an idea that will make their money. So if we've got the ideas here, why don't we have more development? Why don't we have more convert commercialization and value adding right here in, in Victoria? Um, you, know, you look at a lot of sectors in this state, biomed, pharmaceuticals, uh, food tech, uh, uh, financial products. Yeah, we, we are innovators, but there just seems to be a little half step missing between the ideas, the innovations and the development. And what we're proposing through this fund is to actually be able to support businesses to do more of that R&D, that innovation right here. Um, it's not about picking winners uh, and there have to be significant private sector inv investment as well. But it's more about saying, you know, we'd like to see that development take place here rather than just shunt it offshore. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is, I think, the sort of thing where I could work with Melbourne Chamber members uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, say, so let's, let's have that conversation about what innovations, what initiatives government, state government could actually implement to make that happen. Now, now there might be some things around federal government um, uh, tax structures, which might be a disadvantage here. State governments can be an advocate for change. So you know, even if it's a federal issue, uh, my view is if I'm Premier, I'm gonna be banging down the door of whoever the Prime Minister is saying, look, there are things that we could do here in Victoria. If we're being held back because of a federal tax structure, work with me to change it because we've got great people, great ideas, but we don't, we don't make the most of them as, as well as we can. And that's something that needs to change. Fantastic, hear, hear. And just one final question. Um, given I've worked for a while in regional Victoria, would you like to just go back and identify any further opportunities you see for regional Victoria and the role it can play in the recovery uh, as we move out of this COVID phase? Sure. Well, look, um, obviously, tourism is a, a really uh, important part of our economy. We've, we've called for a, a dedicated $200 million regional tourism fund. Um, and we also, we've, we joined Paul yesterday um, in, uh, in terms of our messaging and saying we need to have a clear plan to get Victoria reopened for tourism. Uh, you know, my, my mate Bill Tilly, the member for Benambra, he says it's ridiculous. You, um, you can go across the, across the border to Albury, you can stay a night there, but you can't stay a night in Wodonga. Uh, we're actually, we're unnecessarily holding ourselves back uh, by the, the depth of the restrictions that we've got in place here in Victoria. And they're not supported by the medical evidence that's going to the National Cabinet either, by the way. So reopening Victoria, particularly regional tourism, is yeah. critical. It supports a lot of jobs. It's so important uh, for those regional communities and their economies. We need to get them open. We think it's a role for the government to not just release the restrictions, but to actively support regional tourism through a dedicated investment fund. Uh, but beyond that, we're, a big, we're big supporters of decentralisation. Um, 
Victoria has seen massive population growth in recent years, but most of that has gone into Melbourne. And that has come at a cost. There is a cost of living consequence to enormous population growth concentrated in just one area. Roads are more congested, public transport's more congested, uh, hospital waiting lists are getting longer. Uh, you compare that with regional Victoria, where there are job opportunities uh, and they can't find people to do the jobs. So we've actually got a mismatch in some ways between where our population is and where our economic opportunities are. We think that a government that wants to govern for the whole of Victoria with decentralisation policies will actually make sure we can share some of that population growth with our regions where they need the workforce, they need the population growth, uh, but people won't move to a regional area if they're not confident that there's good hospitals, good local schools, mm -hmm. good job opportunities. They also need to know what's there. We used to have a regional living expo, uh, which, which operated for many years under governments of both complexions, and the Andrews government killed it off. Um, now, you know, when I go around and speak to local councils in, in regional areas, they say, we'd love the opportunity to come to Melbourne and to showcase the opportunities that we have here. You know, let, let us show you the quality of life. Let us show you how good our schools are. Let us show you, you know, the fact that you can get to work in five minutes instead of, instead of 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let us show you the sort of jobs that we have here and what they pay uh, and what you can get for your money in the local housing market compared to trying to buy into Melbourne. So we think there's a great opportunity for the state government to actually provide a platform so people better understand the opportunities that exist in regional Victoria. Current government's not doing that. We're encouraging them to do it. If they don't, we will. That's great. Thanks, Diane. Michael, I wanted to ask you, um, opposition you know, can be a lonely environment. Um, and I'm, I know you much prefer governing rather than being in opposition, but how do our members, particularly the Melbourne Chamber members that, that see it through a global lens um, as well, how do they engage with you in a meaningful way? Yeah, sure, Paul, that's a really good question. I mean, I'm, um, there's not many upsides to being in opposition. Uh, in fact, there are none really, but um, you do have slightly, slightly more time than when you're in government. And I see this as an opportunity, not just for me, but for my shadow ministers and for my MPs to make sure we really develop those links with the community, particularly with the business community, uh, that are important to helping our policy formulation and uh, to what we hope will be a plan for government, a plan for, to take Victoria forward. So um, things like this are terrific, but I'm very happy to meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. My shadow ministers are very keen to get out and, and speak to businesses and see how things are going and, and understand from their perspective what government could be doing to help, or alternatively, what government's doing, which is getting in the way the government should stop doing. Um, that's, a big, that's a big part of policy as well. It's working out what governments are doing, they should just stop, rather than you know, everything about being about new initiatives. Um, so look, we, I try and be as accessible as I can, uh, and I, I know my shadow ministers have the same view. Uh, we we wanna get out and about. If you've if you're a tourism business uh, and you want to have a chat with me or you want to have a chat with David Hodgett, our Shadow Minister for Tourism, uh, shoot us an email, give us a call. Happy to, happy to come, well, when we're allowed to, happy to come out, have a cup of coffee with you. Uh, you know, we, are, we need to be accessible because frankly, um, no political party has got a mortgage on good ideas. No politician knows everything. Some of us pretend we do, but we don't. Um, we will do a better job if we engage with people in the real world, people who run businesses, people who understand the challenges that are faced and understand what needs to be done to overcome those challenges. So, uh, Paul, open offer to, to the members. Um, happy to engage with you one-on-one, -on -one, happy to engage with you as a shadow cabinet uh, and, uh, you know, give me a buzz. Brilliant. We'll, we'll make sure that, that opportunity is available to uh, all of our Melbourne Chamber members. Michael, as always, you've been really generous with your time. And you know, we can tell from today's conversation that politics in the Victorian government, particularly over the next period, will be very interesting as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis. Let's hope that sooner rather than later, because you know, I like to think that our response to COVID should be the legacy that we leave, not the virus itself. With that, I'd like to ask our Victorian Chamber Deputy President, Adrian Cloden, to provide a summary and thanks for today's event. Adrian.
Thanks, Paul, and it's my job to uh, thank Michael, uh, Michael O'Brien again uh, for elaborating on his plan to get Victoria back to work and back in business. Um, our success in containing the virus has come at a very high cost of business, employment, the health of the community in ways other than the virus, for example, mental health. We are in a health and economic crisis, the likes of which we've not seen before. And because we are in unprecedented, unprecedented times, in the real sense of the word, no one person or entity really has a complete and tried and true roadmap to recovery. Not the health professionals, not the economists, not the public policy people. That's why we need to hear from Michael today with his very constructive input to restoring the economy of uh, Victoria. Thanks, Michael, for a deeper dive into your plan in the last 30 minutes. You've raised some really important points. Uh, about universities and returning to their studies, international students, which is vital for Victoria, given the, the importance of uh, universities to this uh, state. You uh, raised the, the issue of infrastructure, where you recommend uh, smaller scale, possibly regional projects, uh, in addition to the completion of the current projects, uh, to get the state going in the shorter term, rather than a focus on the bigger mega projects uh, that are way out into the future. Uh, your point about increased apprent apprenticeships for skills and reduced energy costs to uh, support business and your very important point about um, tourism and the opening of uh, the regions which we lag other states. So you've made uh, a number of very important points of elaboration and detail uh, today. So thank you, uh, Mike, for that. And thanks to the Chamber team who deliver our now expected stream of very important webinars. And a special thanks to our Melbourne Chamber of Commerce members who've joined us today. We look forward to seeing you soon at an upcoming event. And that concludes the webinar. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, thanks Michael. Guys. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. <laughs>